Today, we have Heather McGee on the podcast. Heather is an expert in economic and social policy. The former president of the inequality-focused think tank Demos, McGee has drafted legislation, testified before Congress, and contributed regularly to news shows, including NBC's Meet the Press. She now chairs the board of Color of Change, the nation's largest online racial justice organization. McGee holds a BA in American Studies from Yale University and a, woohoo, and a JD from the University of California at Berkeley School of Law. Her latest book is called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Heather, thanks so much for being on my show today. Hey, good to be with you. I'm a fellow Yale alumni, so that's why I said yeah. that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I want to um, uh, talk some, a little bit about the development of your thinking about this topic and why you, uh, you know, you're so passionate about it and, and what, you know, kind of trace that development a little bit. So you spent years working on economic policy for Demos, right, which is a liberal mm-hmm. think tank. How mm-hmm. did that work uh, relate to what you're doing today? What are some things that you saw, you know, some of the kind of conversations you had when you worked there that made you um, start to go in this direction? Well, I really was lucky to get an entry level job um, when I was 22 years old at a startup think tank that was focused on an issue that wasn't really top of mind for a lot of policymakers and media folks at the time, which was rising inequality. The fact that um, we were having more and more concentration of wealth, that the quality of jobs for working in middle class families was starting to decline, and the costs for the basics healthcare, housing, childcare, et cetera, was, was sort of shooting through the roof. And in previous eras in economic policy in the United States, mm. there had been big consensus making efforts to try to address what was beginning to be sort of wide scale problems. And so we did what you're sort of supposed to do. We brought the research to the policymakers. We testified, we drafted legislation. Uh, we pointed out what was going on uh, at the kitchen tables of working families across the country. And yet so often um, the overwhelming statistical evidence seemed to fall on deaf ears. And there was this sort of undercurrent of opposition to doing anything about these big problems that were keeping families up at night. And oftentimes the issues that I was working on were economic issues uh, and they had racial disparities you know, for example, healthcare, right? It was an issue where employers were, were, were shedding healthcare benefits and people were finding it hard to afford healthcare in the private market. And uh, that's an issue that's, you know, sort of an economic and social policy one, but people of color were more likely to have jobs that empl- where employers didn't offer healthcare benefits. And so we sort of saw race as kind of an add-on to this larger issue of inequality. Discrimination and disadvantage compounds the effects of inequality for for families of color. But after nearly two decades, I I kind of climbed the ranks from an entry-level role in the economic program at my organization to becoming president. I realized that more and more, there was a fundamental disconnect between policymakers and working families across the country, and that our political conversation about what we sort of owed one another and how we should address really widespread problems was really twisted and kind of warped by a lot of stereotypes and degraded ideas about people who were suffering and a general sort of knee-jerk anti-government response that seemed just to put the United States as an outlier. And so I began to ask this question, why is it that we can't seem to have nice things, Scott? Why is it that Mm -hmm. Americans can't seem to have nice things? And by that, I don't mean like drive-through espresso. I mean, nice (laughs) things like, you know, affordable health care and a well-funded public school in every neighborhood and wages that keep workers out of poverty and and modern world-class infrastructure. And on some of these issues, particularly around infrastructure and good paying jobs, we used to lead the world. So I, I began to ask what happened and, and why do we keep having these policies that make inequality worse? And why is our politics so unresponsive to the needs of working families? So I quit my job. I hit the road. Uh, I went on a number of trips across the country from California and Mississippi and Maine and back again. And and I and I found what seemed to me to be the answer that I was missing. Yeah, and and as I was reading into your story, I think also your uh, experience with pregnancy and motherhood also uh, had an impact as well. You're thinking about yeah, this? yeah, sure. I mean, I um, 
I was pregnant with my first and now only child, but with, with, mm-hmm. you know, for the first time, um, when I made this decision, uh, I think a little bit of that had to do with the feeling of if I was going to birth the baby of a book and birth a real baby, I needed to not have, you know, 75 other babies, which were my staff members that I was raising money for and all that. It was sort of like, there's only so much, you know, to yeah. give here. Um, but also it was a feeling of, you know, if I had spent nearly two decades using the tools of the policy advocacy trade and asking questions that were about statistical analysis and about wages and jobs and benefits and public spending and taxes. And that if I was going to, you know, work for the first time was going to take me away from something I loved, right? In addition to being something I love. And I thought, you know what, let me, let me just do what I really need to do. Let me, let me not keep doing what I've been doing, which has in some ways hit a wall. Let me use my time and use, you know, whatever I have as a person to my utmost. Let me, let me be of my highest, best use. And that's where, and maybe this is really relevant to you, that's where I started to inquire about whole different fields of research around psychology and social science, public opinion, political science, not just economics. And um, it opened up a whole new world. Yeah, I mean, I think the more perspectives, the better, right? You know, trying to kind of integrate them. Yeah, so that's wonderful. So thanks for that that background. You're, in your uh, book, you say that it's an invitation of hope. I love that. First of all, I love that. What is it a hope for? Well, it's a hope for an America in which we really see ourselves in one another, in which we are not so divided along lines of race and class and politics, Mm -hmm. in which we understand that no matter where you come from, what you look like, who you love, um, we all pretty much want the same things, right? We want to be able to meet our basic needs. We want a shot at fulfilling our dreams. We want to be respected and safe and feel valued by, by, by our neighbors and, and by our fellow uh, citizens. And, and that ultimately, the really important things that matter in life, we can't do on our own. You know, we have a very individualistic culture in the United States. And yet the things that really matter, uh, things that are really important, we've got to do together. I can't, I can recycle as much as I want. I can't avert global climate change disasters on my own. Um, You know, I can teach my kid to read, but I can't make sure there's a well-funded school in his neighborhood on my own. Um, You know, I can't ensure that that none of my neighbors is living in poverty. I, I can't do that on my own. And, and those are the things that we have to do together. And in a multiracial democracy, as our country is, as our country has promised to be, uh, um, you know, we, we've got to come together and, and stop demonizing one another and, and get the meanness out of, our, out of our discourse about who one another is and really be able to trust our communities to know what's best for themselves and to be able to be responsive as a collective to the needs of our different communities. Here, 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 here. I couldn't agree with that more. Um, but, you know, as the racial composition of America changes, you have, you have a, a, a large section of people that are very worried, you know, they, that business as usual for them is changing and they are thinking about it in a zero sum way, as you point out. First of all, you know, I, I want to just talk about this zero sum idea. First of all, you talk about there's kind of an asymmetry that you've noticed where you think, um, well, talk, if you could talk about that asymmetry among uh, different demographics in terms of the way they think about it as zero-sum or not zero-sum. Yeah, so this was one of the first um, sociological insights that really set me off on my journey and really turned a light bulb on for me. I, I spoke with a, a set of academics who had done research on this idea of the zero-sum racial competition, the idea that progress for one group has to come at the expense of the other. Um, that a dollar more in my pocket must mean a dollar less in yours. And that's an idea that leads to a lot of, um, you know, obviously a lot of division, a lot of um, self-sabotaging behavior, 
um, because there's this resentment of the people who you see is on the opposing team, right? You you want more than anything for them not to score points. And it doesn't matter if that means that you won't score points, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that thinking um, that for somebody else to, to gain something you have to lose is really prominent among white Americans and much less so among, among Black folks. Uh, and, you know, we don't think that progress for us has to come at white people's expense um, by and large. And yet it's a really predominant worldview among white Americans. And, mm. and, and when I first read, you know, the sort of the marquee study on this, this zero sum question, which is really called whites now see race as a zero sum game that they're losing, mm. um, which was, uh, a study done during the Obama era, um, and then there were a lot more studies that talked about something very similar, which is a sense of group status threat, that the rising diversity uh, is seen by many white Americans as a threat to their status, um, that it will end up badly for them, uh, and that in turn changes their ideas about things that are nominally race neutral, right? So in these experiments, for example, a uh, uh, a white independent voter will be shown a, a headline that says, you know, people of color to become the majority in 2042. And they will take, you know, opinion, they will have opinion conversations before and after seeing that headline. And before to after, there'll be this major conservative shift on issues like raising the minimum wage and national health insurance and even things like drilling in the Arctic. And it's a very interesting, we've obviously seen that play out in our politics, right? That's become a political strategy of the right Mm -hmm. wing. But I'm also interested in, I know why powerful forces would be selling that story, but I'm interested in why uh, ordinary folks are buying it, why they see the idea of a truly equal America as oppression for themselves as opposed to just equality, while at the same time often denying that they have any privilege, right? That's the funny jujitsu, right? It's like, there is no racism. I don't have privilege. And yet all of my kind of behaviors and rhetoric would suggest that I'm very afraid of losing something. So what is that something that you're afraid of losing if you don't think you have elevated status, right? Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. So let's unpack it. It's good stuff. Well, there's large sections of white Americans who are poor. They feel like they're losing. They are losing in the system as well. And mm-hmm. as you point out, this doesn't have to be zero sum. So recognizing right. that there's that white people suffer too, and black people, no, is is uh, is is definitely a way forward as opposed to saying that only one race uh, suffers and another race never suffers. Um, mm-hmm. That's not that's not a way to to uh, uniting the country. Um, so do they, what do they feel? The thing is, you know, the the whiteness is is it's a white is a heterogeneous group, right? So mm-hmm. uh, it's it seems like when you're saying this, it seems like it's breaking down very much on political lines because you certainly have mm-hmm. um, large swaths of white liberals who at least they'll say, you know, that that they don't view it as a zero sum game. So um, yeah. what's the justification for like talking about white people as a as a as, a, as like a group? I'm, well, I'm generally, generally curious about that. Yeah. So um, so there are two pieces of that. One, white liberals are are the minority of white people. Um, and so and this is something that often. Is that true? In, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know. I didn't know that. So yeah, hold on a no, I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a very interesting thing that um, because whiteness sort of grows. Right. White, white whiteness sort of, um, you know, ends up taking up a lot of space and, and kind of um, representation, you would think if you're in a white liberal enclave or if you you are a white liberal and your friends are white liberals, that sort of, you know, liberalism is 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 a project um, of 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 white folks. But in fact, just a few indicators, the mm. majority of no Democrat has won the majority of the white vote since Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts into law. That was it. Wow. That was the break. Um, before that, as I talk about in The Sum of Us, um, white Americans were actually very progressive, really believed the majority of white Americans, um, two thirds of white Americans believed in the mid-1950s and in 1960 that 
government ought to guarantee a job for everyone who wanted one, who couldn't find one, and that there ought to be a, a minimum income in the country so no one would fall below a certain threshold and the government should guarantee that. Those are big liberal ideas, right? That's like a big government <laughs> vision. Yeah. Um, and, you know, most white people were New Deal Democrats, right? They wanted Social Security. They wanted public jobs and the WPA and, you know, just massive government public works because they had benefited from it. And between 1960 and 1964, which was really a period of, of you know, sort of an explosion of civil rights activity and a period when the Democratic Party really associated itself, not just with the New Deal, but with civil rights, um, you saw the share of white Americans who believed in such a strong role for government uh, and those two ge- government guarantees, right, a guaranteed job and guaranteed income, fall in half from nearly 70% in 1960 to just 35% in 1964. And of course, then, you know, Kennedy, who was really associating the party with civil rights, uh, his successor would be the last Democrat to win the majority of the white vote. And so in many ways, the story of of what happened to our politics to, to sort of break the coalition of working and middle class white people who had been in the liberal camp who had thought that, you know, government should set the rules for what business can and can't do, um, should provide protections for, for families, should invest in the future, should tax the wealthy and and plow those resources into the common good. That really broke with the civil rights movement. And in The Some of Us, I, I have a, a story that kind of is a memorable way for us to think about that. Um, which is what happened to public swimming pools. We used to have these grand resort style pools in America um, that were publicly funded uh, and that were, you know, could hold thousands of swimmers at a time. And many of them were segregated and for whites only, not just in the South, but across the country. And once integration in the civil rights movement uh, promised to let black families swim too, many towns across the country drained their public pools rather than integrate them. And so what that meant was that uh, white families also lost out on the pool, so did black families. It it meant that um, what was once a public good uh, then became a private luxury, right? If you were rich enough to build a backyard swimming pool, you could still swim. Or if you you could join a a private fee-based membership swimming club, which cropped up all over the country. And I use that story of the drained pool to talk about what happened to a country that had found the formula for middle class prosperity, right? High wages, high levels of of, of labor unions and collective bargaining, um, you know, a minimum wage that reached its peak in 1968, high levels of taxation on the, the marginal kind of last dollar income of millionaires uh, and, and big public investments like free college. Government used to pick up the tab for college and all of that had a racial asterisk. It was for whites only. And once integration promised to put people on on an even playing field and expand and do for black families what had been done for white families for generation, white folks sort of left the bargain. And yes, there are still, of course, uh, many white liberals, but they are the minority of the white population. And our politics and the inequality that has come has really been shaped by that political factor more than any other. Hey everyone, I'm excited to announce that the eight-week online Transcend course is back. This iteration of the course, which will run from September 5th to October 24th of this year, will use science to help you live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. There will be limited slots available, so save your spot as soon as possible. In addition to the regular class pricing, we're also offering limited slots for personal self-actualization coaching. Save your spot today by going to transcendcourse.com. That's transcendcourse.com. The Transcend course is just one of the offerings of the brand new Center for the Science of Human Potential. The Center for the Science of Human Potential's mission is to use science to help each person fulfill their highest potential and contribute to the good of society. Toward that goal, we offer classes, coaching, and consulting opportunities to help people apply the latest science to help themselves, their organizations, their schools, their families, and their communities to be more creative, loving, and full of transcendent possibilities. For more on the center, you can go to scienceofhumanpotential.com. Hey everyone, doing this podcast for y'all is one of my greatest privileges, but the cost of maintaining a professional production like this one really adds up. I'm grateful to today's sponsors who help fund the show. 
but if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. You'll get completely ad-free episodes all while directly supporting the show for as little as $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash psychpodcast. Well, thank you for, for educating me about that because it, that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly interested in the truth and not just my own perception, but my own perception was, was different. You know, in this sense, we, I mean, we elected, you know, Biden won, you know, he's, he's a liberal. He, we have Kamala, you know, who's an African-American. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and the majority issue, of yeah. white people voted against that. The majority of white people voted for Trump. <gasps> that, so the statistic, the majority of white people voted against Biden. That's the, the yeah. statistic. Yeah. I, I yeah. see what you're saying. Um, you know, and it could also just be this, the circles I swim in, of course. For and sure. so, yeah, so it's yeah. like, it's like the, uh, I'm taking the water for granted, so to speak, yeah. you know, like a, a, <laughs> a, a fish in water, you know, metaphor. Um, okay. Well, so cool. So um, I want to, I want to learn more. So uh, the idea of white privilege, you talked about that a second. You said a lot of uh, white people don't want to admit it, that they have white privilege. I think that that, that term is one of the most misunderstood uh, terms. I would love it if you could uh, just actually define what that means, because I think that sometimes some people take a really uh, caricatured version of it, which is not mm-hmm. even what a lot of black people mean when they say it, you know, mm-hmm. and they say, oh, they think I white privilege, they think I don't suffer ever. Now, I don't think mm-hmm. that's what, what, what you're saying, mm-hmm. right? So right. if you could please, uh, let's, let's get this on the record. Yeah, I think white privilege is the privileges that are afforded uh, to people with white skin in a society with a lot of bias against people who don't have white skin. Um, And that doesn't mean that all white people are rich or all white people have it easy, but it does mean that, generally speaking, if a white person is down on his luck, is struggling, is poor, it's not because he's white. And it also means, most importantly, and I think this is this is really a contribution I'm trying to make with the some of us. When racial justice advocates talk about white privilege, we don't want to end white privilege by. um, Here, let me put it this way. So white privilege means today that white people as a whole have greater access to affordable health care, have better funded schools, um, are less liable to be discriminated against because of their color or the way their name is spelled, um, you know, when trying to get a job. And it's not that in the world that we seek, we want white people. And of course, you know, quite importantly, white people are less likely to have to fear the police. And it's not that in the world we seek, we want white people to fear the police or not have good schools or not have good jobs or not have health care. We want them to. Right. And the only problem should be that should be something that everybody should agree with, that it's not fair um, for uh, in a country where the government explicitly segregated and discriminated and approved of massive thefts of black land and property and all of that well through the 20th century. It's not fair that one's skin color and the community that one was born into is so shaped by racist decisions. Um, and, or it, th- that it's not fair that the it's not fair that your outcomes in life are so shaped by racist decisions. Mm. And the world we seek is one in which we all have equal opportunity and nobody's invested in denying the truth of what our country is and has been. Um, And I think it's really important. The, the, the sort of knee jerk, I'm not privileged or the knee jerk opposition to addressing racial justice or even learning about racial injustice um, I think really comes from that zero sum idea, right? That if that if the public and the government pays attention to the needs of this community, it's going to cost me somehow, and they're going to stop paying attention to my needs. And that's that's simply not true, um, right? If you look at the proposals right now that 
would be a, a massive refilling of the pool of public goods, mm. uh, the American Jobs Plan, the American Families Plan. There's there's something in there for every family, right? There's rural broad, broadband, which disproportionately would impact, you know, white conservative districts. Um, yeah. But there's also, you know, massive. Um, housing and and rent subsidies uh, that would help people in in high cost urban areas. I mean, we've got to realize that we are on the same team and that we are not each other's enemy. And in fact, the the downward mobility, the loss of good factory jobs that is often kind of animates white grievance. It's not about what brown and black people have done. They're not the ones who shuttered the factories. They're not the ones who. Um, you know, had massive tax cuts that have, you know, impoverished our communities. Um, they're not the ones who are refusing Medicaid expansion and health care, which would keep rural health care and hospitals open. Right. It's it's the rich and powerful. And so the the blame game that has always been the story has been that the zero sum story is a lie sold by powerful self-interested elites to redirect blame for what's going on uh, f- away from themselves and towards, frankly, usually brown and black people who are struggling even more than the white people who are buying that zero sum story. Awesome. This is a really good launching pad for a discussion between a quality of opportunity versus quality of outcome. You know, some people have criticized the focus on a quality of outcome instead of a quality of opportunity, making the case that not every racial disparity is necessarily unjust, right? I'm sure mm-hmm. you would agree with, agree with that. So uh, knowing that case, do you think that there can ever be like an assumption that some things are the result of racism that are actually more multi-determined, like certain inequalities? Have you ever seen that? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I just think that... um Usually, let's start from a recognition that most people of all races know probably 10 to 15 percent of how much racist policymaking has determined economic opportunity in America, right? Mm -hmm. Most people don't know anything about redlining, right, which was the Mm -hmm. practice that was done by the New Deal Roosevelt government in a massive expansion of home ownership for white working class people who never would have dreamed that they could own homes. Um, There were massive creation of of subsidized housing, uh, the subsidization of a a new kind of mortgage uh, that would allow people to pay thing, pay off a home over 30 years and, and massive down payment assistance so that most people didn't even have to have a down payment. And that was all done based on maps that the federal government drew in the 1930s and that were used until the 1970s that said black neighborhoods, drew lines around black neighborhoods and said, do not lend to these areas. Crazy. So most people don't know that. So when you talk about, okay, well, there are inequalities today. And you don't know that basic fact because it's not taught in our textbooks. Um, It's not part of the general public understanding the same way that, you know, lunch counters and and Martin Luther King and school segregation are taught, um, if we're lucky. Right. Then it seems like, well, why, why is it that these black neighborhoods are so impoverished? Why don't they have, you know, lots of small businesses and stores? Because there was literally no credit. Credit was denied by government policy from those areas. And what we do know is that wealth begets wealth, right? Today, largely because of that denial of wealth and because we had things like, you know, whole Black neighborhoods that managed to thrive nonetheless being destroyed during the 1960s and 50s to make way for highway developments. And the, you know, the, the highways could have gone anywhere, but as policy, they just rated the black neighborhoods lower and said, well, we're going to do eminent domain and destroy thousands of businesses and homes and scatter these neighborhoods. And that was policy, right? So if you don't know that, then you think, well, there's just something wrong with black people. Why can't they get their neighborhoods together? Mm -hmm. Right. And so we have a racial wealth divide in this country and wealth, not your income, right? The income gap between blacks and whites, despite rampant job discrimination, has has really narrowed, right? 
but it's wealth. It's where it's whether you have a home that you own and so you have home equity to borrow from to pay for your kids college to if whether you have a pension and a 401k, whether you have savings, some inheritance. You know, I, it was so funny to me. You know, I, I went to these great schools and um, and I had all these white friends. And it was when we, when we when it was time to go to college. They all just like had all this random money that just like came from nowhere. It was like an aunt, an uncle, a, you know, a grandparent. There was just going to be something that was going to pay for your college. And it, it just was like, oh, I thought we were kind of the same, you know, like we both work as hard. Like, you know, my parents were professionals. Your parents were professionals. But there was this other sort of hidden benefit that just sort of swooped in and changed their lives. Right. So that, you know, my family all had to borrow to go to college. And then a lot of my white friends um, went because it was taken care of. And right now, the average black college graduate has less wealth than the average white high school dropout. Wow. So when you tell me there's some reason other than racism for these economic disparities. I think if you, if you really know what our country has done in terms of wealth accumulation, and then you say that, that's one thing. But most of the time that comes from just like kind of reading the way neighborhoods look and just sort of assuming, you know, sort of like a common sense and in, in the absence of, of, of real knowledge about, what's been done and how history shows up in your wallets. Um, so I, I think we have to be more intellectually curious about why it is that there are these group-based disparities, because if not, then what it comes down to is maybe there's just something different about these groups of people. Mm. And maybe there's something better about white people is why they always end up on top. And then, you know, that's a slippery slope. That is a slippery slope, and that is a great fear uh, with going too much into the responsibility line of thinking. You, well, you talk about you know problems with um, the, resp- the responsibility narrative in in your book. What's the responsibility narrative? Well, that if uh, if African Americans are not uh, succeeding, that the idea is well, they need to take responsibility for having more. Oh, like work, personal responsibility. Harder. Yeah, yeah. personal responsibility. Yeah. yeah, got yeah. it. Yeah. That 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 is this that is a big slippery slope, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you also do want to encourage responsibility. You know, there's probably a lot of cases with people who are um, uh, not succeeding at that it's not doesn't come down to racism. So um, it, it's it, it, well, it's also tricky. Yeah. I mean, sure. But, you know, there are a lot of white people who are not succeeding. Right? Very true. Very you know what true. I, mean? I think, yes, I think yes. basically I mean, and this is what it yes. comes down to, Scott. You know, I think in general. Hard work with all the barriers um, that, you know, Black communities that have been strategically disinvested um, have faced. The idea that hard work is kind of like absent in those communities. First of all, the majority of Black people are not in poverty, right? And we tend to Mm -hmm. see poverty as a Black problem or think the majority of Black families are impoverished. And that's not the case, right? Um, At all. And the majority of of Black families are working in middle class folks. Uh, There are not a lot of rich Black people, um, but they're, you know, most people are working in middle class and work even harder because they have no cushion. Right. You know, the the average household wealth of a Black woman um, is around five dollars. So that means every paycheck comes in and goes out. Right. It's a constant. And even if that paycheck is $50,000 a year, right, there's just no cushion. There was nothing that was free that was handed out at birth or, you know, showed up in in a trust for them um, when when their parents died. Uh, And and that's I think it's really um, I think it's really a mistake to assume that the qualities that. um, Yeah, I just think it's a mistake to assume that there are more people of color who are, you know, lazy or not working hard, then there are white people who are lazy or not working hard. And I think if you know your history, you know where that trope of lazy Black people came from. It was to justify slavery, right? What What is lazier than you literally not working and owning people who work for free for you? Sure. 
What's oh, lazier true. than as many billionaires have done during this pandemic, seeing your wealth go up just because of the stock market? Like the most work you're doing on your investments is opening the envelope and seeing the dividends and the stock buybacks and the 25% returns. It's not because of any more work than you did. That's just gambling. That's just passive income. Mm -hmm. And yet we value wealth and the tax code taxes wealth at a lower rate than it taxes work, than people who wake up before dawn and go to clean offices and go to stock grocery shelves and go to work in childcare centers. I mean, we have our hierarchy of human value completely upside down in this country. And I think it comes from our original sin of allowing an economic system that was based on stolen land, stolen people, and stolen labor. I've been on the search for the perfect mattress for the past few years. And let me tell you, I've gone through so many mattresses. My friends have made fun of me because for so long, I didn't actually own a mattress. I just went through so many free trials. I had no idea what it feels like to be well rested until I tried a Helix mattress. Are you not able to sleep because of stress and anxiety? It's definitely understandable given the current state of the world. Psychological research shows that high quality sleep is so important for stress and well-being though. Lack of quality sleep can affect your memory, increase mood swings, and even can lead to depression. While a number of factors contribute to poor sleep quality, your choice of mattress can really matter a lot. Helix Sleep makes personalized mattresses right here in America and ships them straight to your door with free, no contact delivery, free returns, and a 100 night sleep trial. To choose a mattress, Helix made a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. If you like a mattress that's really soft or firm, you sleep on your side or your back or your stomach, or you sleep really hot, with Helix, there's a specific mattress for each and everyone's unique taste. Personally, I took the quiz and I was matched with the Helix Sunset Lux because I wanted something that felt soft and I sleep mostly on my side all night. I've got to say, I love my Helix mattress. I wake up really feeling refreshed and ready to work out or start my work. Also, I've been tracking my sleep with a device and my sleep score is consistently in the good or excellent range. This is a new thing for me, so it's really exciting to finally get high quality sleep. I really do love Helix, but you don't have to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ, Wired Magazine, and Apartment Therapy. Just go to helixsleep.com psychology, take their two minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10 year warranty and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you probably will. Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash psychology. Get up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash psychology. That's helixsleep.com slash psychology. Okay, now back to the show. Fair, fair. Uh, so I think what's really helpful in this kind of thing is just going through more examples, like these vivid kind of stories, because I think, like you said, a lot of people aren't even aware of a lot of this stuff. So did you, you talked about the subprime mortgage crisis already and how that was fueled by racism. I don't, did you talk about it? Yeah, no, we haven't talked about it. It's a chapter Let's in my can, book. Can we, can we talk yeah, about sure. it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, it's a chapter in my book. It's something that I, I care a lot about because it was the issue that I sort of cut my teeth on. Um, in economic policy, I was working on what was sort of this crisis that was going on in the early 2000s and nobody really knew about it or cared about it. Subprime wasn't a household name. This was years before um, the financial crash. But what happened was, you know, because of that redlining that I talked about, the ways in which Black families were segregated and were um, uh were denied mortgages for so long and had to, um, you know, use alternative financing that was was even worse. Um, you had a, about a few years, like a decade, when Black families, because of things like the, the Community Reinvestment Act, were able to get the same kind of loans that white families were. And then you had deregulation and the idea that the financial sector should sort of police itself. And you had these wild, this wild west of new kinds of lenders and brokers that were issuing 
these new kinds of loans that weren't like a 30-year fixed rate loan. They were loans that were, um, you know, had weird new terms like balloon payments and prepayment penalties and exploding interest rates. And they were tested out and aggressively marketed first in the late 1990s and early 2000s when very few people were paying attention on Black homeowning neighborhoods. And so two of the myths that I really wanted to debunk in this part of the book is one, the idea, which I heard when I was trying to advocate to in Washington for regulators to do something about what was going on in these middle-class Black neighborhoods across the country as they were getting these loans and they were ending up in foreclosure. You know, a lot of the kind of white policymaker impression, the stereotype was, well, you know, these people shouldn't really have been able to afford homes in the first place. But they had gotten good loans and were homeowners. And then they were got a knock on the door, received, you know, a whole bunch of phone calls saying, would you like to consolidate your debt? Would you like to get a lower interest rate? Would you like to refinance your loan? Sure. Sounds great. And what was done then was that they were then sold loans that stripped the equity. They had so many fees up front that suddenly their home, they had less in their home than they did before they signed the paperwork. And that had exploding interest rates and prepayment penalties and balloon payments. And so they were ending up in foreclosure, but these were homeowners. These were not people for the most part. The vast majority of subprime loans went to people who were already homeowners. So it was a net negative, not like sort of the price we pay for loosening the standards. And then second, and most importantly, and most importantly, the majority of subprime loans went to people with good credit. And black and brown homeowners with the same credit scores as white homeowners were three times as likely to receive subprime loans. It was simply about aggressive marketing and lenders who knew that they could get away with it in black and brown communities because nobody was going to stop them because of that stereotype that I just talked about. And because it was communities that had rarely been treated well by banks in the first place. Right. And so in the book, I tell the story of the Tomlins were this beautiful, uh, now elderly black family. And, you know, the the broker who sold them their predatory refinance loan, you know, said, you know, God must have sent me to you. And, you know, just like it was like used car dealership types of tactics. And yet it was ultimately racist and discriminatory lending and all the major lenders would ultimately be fined for discriminatory lending. Right. The the you know, the kind of just like old style racist language that was being thrown around in these sort of boiler rooms, just trying to target these families and borrowers that they knew they could sort of get away with anything with. And and policymakers and regulators turned the other way and excused the levels of foreclosure that, you know, were a crisis in Black families in 1999 and 2002. And then it wasn't until Wall Street saw how much money you could make from charging someone 10% 10% interest on a $200,000 loan with three points up front and with a balloon payment that they said, okay, we love, we love this product and we're going to do basically financial engineering to divide up these loans and spread them across different mortgage-backed securities so that there's no big concentration of risk in any one of these securities, sort of spread the risk, keep selling it, keep scal- selling it. And it be- there became this massive demand from from Wall Street for these mortgages. And so that pushed the mortgages out of the black and brown neighborhoods into the wider and whiter mortgage market. And then you had, you know, what when everybody started paying attention in 2007 and 2008, where it was one out of every five mortgages was in this mold. And, you know, people were just buying extra houses to flip them because there was a sense that the mortgage market and the housing market would see no bottom. But it is my firm experience, having been on the front lines of this fight um, from 2002 through the cleanup of the mess when I was one of the core advocates uh, writing the Wall Street Reform Bill and advocating for its passage in 2009, 2010, that if it weren't for racism, both in the discriminatory lending and targeting and the predatory um, marketing and the racist indifference of people with the power to stop it, we would not have had a financial crisis in America. I mean, that's, that's mind boggling and, and so important to, to point out. So you're pretty confident of that. 
Yeah, I am. Incredible, incredible. Um, what an eye-opening book that you've written. Um, and a lot of people need to Thank read it. Thank you. Um, another thing that really, uh, another thing really gripped me as I was reading your book is that you met a reformed white supremacist who now preaches anti-racism. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I met a couple. Can you actually. Tell me that Only story. One ended yeah. up in the book, but um, so her name is Angela. Um, you know, I, for for folks who think about sort of the psychology of hate and 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 something really really important and powerful that my conversations with white supremacists um made really clear to me was this thing of projection, right? This psychological phenomenon where you take the parts of yourself you don't like and you project them onto others and you hate it about other people, right? That's a big piece of, of oh, yeah. what, um, what has, you know, how race has been formulated and manufactured um, because, you know, it's, it's like the, the white folks in power as we sort of started creating the racial stereotypes that are still with us today, we're doing that on, you know, on mass, right. Um, mm -hmm. Because they had the power to. Um, and so Angela in her own life, you know, really hated her own weakness. She, she became a bully because she was bullied. And so she was a neo-Nazi and she became reformed when she was in prison and, um, a black woman became her friend, which, you know, <laughs> I, I never got to talk to that black woman, but I, I'm even more interested in her <laughs> and what was going on with her. Is this, yeah, you know, she went up to, too. in the yard to this, right, yeah. to this yeah. woman covered in Nazi tattoos. Um, yeah, crazy. And and she realized, you know, Angela just had a a, um, a change of heart and, a, and an awakening. And she taught me a lot about the way that the sort of narrative of, of white supremacy gets mainstreamed um, and that inequalities and disparities are, are justified. And there's a certain strong attachment to defending the status quo um, because of a, a sense of what uh, are the real truth and the real story would say about, about yourself as a white person. How is this white supremacy you talked to? How are they, um, how are they preaching uh, anti-racism these days? So what are they up to along those lines? Um, you mean like Angela King and and those folks? The yeah. life after, so she's part. She's one of the co-founders of a group called Life After Hate. Okay, which does I think really important work, which tries to is a, a group of former neo Nazis and white supremacists and tries to organize people out of that life and out of that um, ideology. And I think it's such important work, right? I mean the. Mm. Department of Homeland Security and our national security apparatus has named white supremacist extremism as the most, quote, persistent and legal, excuse me, has named white supremacist extremism and terrorism as the most, quote, persistent and lethal threat to the homeland, unquote. Right. So this is not like a fringe issue. This is an important thing that we have to resource much more widely. And of course, then, you know, a huge part of the problem here is that we've had these white supremacist ideologies going mainstream uh, on conservative news media, obviously with the former president. And so it's given cover of respectability to ideas that if taken to their logical conclusion, right, the idea that white people should fear a more diverse America, that immigrants are making America worse, mm -hmm. that um, black people are all violent and you have to arm yourself with weapons of war to, you know, out of a fear of sort of marauding gangs of black people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is really scary stuff. And then of course the, the big lie of, of the election being stolen and, and Scott, you know, you didn't know that the majority of white people voted for Trump, but if you did, then it makes the big lie make a little more sense, right? The sort of logic is the person who won the majority of the white vote is the legitimate president of America. And whatever else happened in those cities by those people who are criminal and did illegal things and stole something that was rightly ours, right? That that that's where the 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 racist logic of of election fraud and voter fraud and the big lie comes in. And if you know your history, um, then you know when you heard the right wing talking about election fraud. Um, and basically trying to make illegitimate a multiracial majority, 
right? A multiracial majority, mm-hmm. including white, many white people, but not the majority of white people, did vote um, for, for Biden and Harris. And yet the idea is that wasn't legitimate somehow. Mm. And that is um, a very old, uh, not old as an ancient, but it's been around for a long time, uh, trope that, as I describe in my book in the chapter on democracy, you know, I finished writing the book before January 6th, but uh, I describe in great detail uh, something that happened during Reconstruction after the Civil War in Louisiana when a white mob was so infuriated about election results that they stormed the courthouse where the election results were going to be certified. Uh, a bunch of Black people surrounded the courthouse ca- courthouse to defend it, mm-hmm. and um, the white mom massacred the Black people even after they had surrendered, and they burned the courthouse. And um, for me, <laughs> that's an example of, of this white mob that ultimately, you know, would soon come into power, right? The, the, the party and the faction that they were representing um, being so unwilling to submit to a multiracial democracy that they burned the edifice of their own government to the ground. And so the eerie parallels with, with January 6th and what could have happened, what did happen yeah. um, to six people who lost their lives, you know, if you know your history, you could have seen that that's where that rhetoric coming from the White House and, you know, right-wing disinformation was going to lead. Yeah, you do write in your book how the election of Donald Trump made you realize how most white voters weren't operating in their own rational economic self-interest. So these mm-hmm. examples are, are quite right that, that they're not, these individuals are not operating in their own, even in, in their own yeah. rational uh, economic self-interest. Um, you argued that he, you, you believe his populist agenda quote, promise to wreak economic, social, and environmental havoc on them along with everyone else. Can you please elaborate on that a little bit? So Trump's agenda, I wouldn't have called it a populist agenda because mm. I don't think it was a I populist called it that, <laughs> but yeah, okay, maybe. Right? Yeah. Um, so a populist agenda would have been, uh, wouldn't have had his one major signature legislative accomplishment be, you know, $2 trillion in tax cuts largely to the wealthy that and corporations that would then include loopholes that actually raise taxes on the working and middle class, you know, three years down the line. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. That's not a populist, right? Yeah. Uh, a populist wants to uh, bring big corporations, big polluters, big oils, big big tech, big, big concentrated power, the robber barons and the billionaires wants to bring them to heel um, to ensure that they're not abusing workers and abusing, you know, our planet and our air and water. Uh, that's not what he did, right? He loosened the, the rules on as many industries as he could, right? It, it, you know, so, you know, I think that um, the, I include in the book a chapter on the relationship between white male identity politics and climate denialism. Um, which I wasn't intending to write when I set out to write the book because I didn't know that there was a link. I didn't actually think about the fact that, you know, the party that is so opposed to taking action on climate change is overwhelmingly white and male. And Mm. that, um, you know, if you look at the public opinion data, the majority of white Americans are in this sort of squishier, skeptical, doubtful, not that alarmed or concerned, think that it's probably not worth it to to make big changes camp. And that's very different to your point about the the sort of water we swim in. You know, you think of your typical environmentalist, you think of like a white guy in a Patagonia vest climbing, you know, <laughs> like that. Yeah, you actually yeah. think the environmentalism like is sort of a white thing, right? But in fact, there's a big like 20 to 30 point gulf between black and brown Americans and white Americans on how concerned we are about climate change and environmental pollution. Um, and that that is partially because um, black and brown Americans are, are one and a half and twice as likely to live in polluted areas and to drink wow. um, unclean water and, 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 and live near places, you know, toxic sites and, and, and all of that. And that's because of environmental racism, because the, the people who are in power get to think, well, we can just sort of, you know, shunt the excesses of our industrial economy onto the kind of other side of the tracks. And yet one of the 
things that I learned in the course of writing The Sum of Us was that if you have that dynamic where people in power think that they can sort of just, you know, a- a- offshore, like to the other neighborhood, um, to a black or brown neighborhood, pollution, they tend not to demand that the corporation p- control the pollution, right? Because it's like not going to affect them. And so that means that there's more pollution in total than there would have been had there been the sense that, oh, this is going to impact me and people I care about. And so actually more segregated cities have more cancer causing pollution for everyone because the usually white power structure um, is, is, is sort of operating under that zero sum illusion, right? That I can sort of profit from the benefits of this and that the cost can go on the other side of the human divide. But that's, that is an illusion. And so, you know, that study was called is is environmental justice good for white folks too, right? <laughs> you know, right, is, right, right. is de-linking the, you know, sort of racist pollution good for white people too? And, and that's really the message throughout my book is that racism has a cost for everyone, that we've got to know, we've got to all learn the basic facts about our country and our systems um, because they're distorting because racism in our politics and our policymaking is distorting our functioning as a as a society. It's it's eroding the things we hold in common. It's draining the pool of public resources. Mm-hmm. It's giving more and more power to the wealthy and self interested elite. Um, it's it's making it harder for working and middle class people to thrive of all backgrounds. It's undermining support for government. It's undermining support for collective action and collective bargaining um, because of this disdain and this distrust. When you When you have that division, it's easy for us to be conquered by self-interested forces who want to keep the economic and, and, and political power exactly as they have it. Why don't more people know about this stuff? You know, what do you think is kind of the biggest barrier to, uh, to, to miss, you know, there's so much misinformation being spread these days, right? What do you see as the biggest barrier? I think the biggest barrier is that in general, uh, our systems, our education system, our media, Ha, our politics have been dominated by white people, and there's been a campaign to minimize our knowledge of the wounds of our history, um, because there's a desire to keep up the sort of Disney-fied story of, of America. And there's a fear of retribution, there's a fear of loss, there's a fear of guilt and responsibility and blame but like those are like childish, those are, you know, childish impulses and grownups kind of face the facts and move forward. And it feels like we're sort of stuck in an adolescent phase in this country. And, and what you're seeing now with this right wing desire to stop schools from teaching about race and racism um, is, is just another phase of, of, of what is known as the sort of lost cause campaign to try to change the story of of the Civil War and change the story of Jim Crow um, to be one that is more sympathetic and that minimizes uh, the extent of the racism. And so I think we're miseducated by our schools. Um, Less than 10 percent of high school seniors surveyed by the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, identified that slavery was a primary cause of the Civil War. It's just Mm -hmm. that's just insane. Right. We've been robbed of our own history. And so in the absence of that knowledge, and I'm, ta- you know, the, some of the history I'm talking about in my book is from, you know, 2009, right? And, and, and even if it is from, uh, you know, 1821, that's not so long ago. Other societies, school children are memorizing, you know, thousands of years worth of dynasties, right? And, and, and we have a couple hundred years to know the basic facts of. And it's it's that psychological desire to minimize, to project, to deflect that is ultimately robbing us of our collective history. It's keeping us divided from one another and leaving us vulnerable to the exploitation of the powerful self-interested elite. And I think that, you know, we we've we've got to be smarter. We've got to be stronger. We've got to be tougher. We've got to grow up. Um, we've got to grow up and 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 not accept the easy answers that make us feel better um, for 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 what's happening in our country um, because you know time is running out time is running out for the planet time's running out on democracy it's running out on inequality 
Um, and we, we used to have uh, the formula in this country for broadly shared prosperity and for tackling big problems together. And, you know, in my reading, once, once the right wing really tripled down on racial resentment and the controlling of, of our democracy and rigging the rules to keep power concentrated, you know, they sort of gave up on problem solving. They gave up on trying to actually make people's lives better uh, and try to sort of steward our common resources. And, and, and the majority of white people are still giving them power every single election cycle, still, still returning that power um, to, to a, a worldview, an ideology, a party um, that is, is selling the zero sum and bankrupting uh, us as a result. And you are going from zero sum to win win. Yes, I'm all, about, I'm all about that. So let's end on uh, 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 the, the spirit of hope that we started on as well, which uh, was the point of your book. <laughs> yeah, so can, I, yeah, I talk about in the book that even though there's this there's this zero sum worldview that's being sold, um, I met across the country people who rejected the zero sum and I rejected. who <laughs> <laughs> I rejected. and who were willing to. Uh, fight for what I call the solidarity dividend, which is these mm-hmm. gains that we can unlock when we come together across lines of race to to work in the public interest and work for the common good and to recognize that we've got to refill the pool. Um, mm-hmm. We can't let racism keep draining it because it's it's costing us all. And so I do believe that that is our future. That is that is what is promised to us. That's to me what what a multiracial democracy can can create is a real understanding of our common humanity uh, because of the proximity of so much difference in the United States. I, I think that's where we're going and I hope that's where we're going. Um, but, you know, everybody who agrees with that is, has really got a fight on their hands because um, the forces of, of disinformation and division have never been more well-resourced and had more sophisticated technological tools. So, there's no there's no time to be sitting on the sidelines, right? If you if you think we should be teaching about our history in our schools, you you gotta talk about it, right? You gotta say this is good for my white kids too, right? To learn the history of the country and the and the the, the society that they're born into. Um, if you think that we need to do everything we can to lift the floor for workers in poverty, white, black, and brown, you gotta speak up about it. Um, you know, and the list and list the list goes on and on. It's so this is the problem with the culture war is that you have people on the other side who's, who's, who will say the argument that if if you think that it's terrible that that we're teaching critical race theory in schools, you gotta speak up. This is the division of this culture war is that people are in their echo chambers saying to each other, you know, uh, you need to speak up and, and people are speaking up against different things. And man, I, I just I so wish we could unite us all like you are like you say in the beginning, we all have the same basic needs. We have the same basic. We want the same things. And you make a very, very compelling case in your book for why um, uh, racism hurts everyone. So look, I just want to be say I'm really grateful for you coming on my podcast today, Heather, and talking to my audience. I know you're super busy. I really appreciate your time and much gratitude. Thank you. Thanks so for the conversation. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Uh, 100%. 100%. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.